Chapter 2 At Tea Naples and of Young Hans's Moral State The change was no loss to him, for he entered the home of his appointed guardian, Consul Teenapple, where he wanted for nothing. Certainly this was true so far as his bodily needs were concerned, and not less in the sense of safeguarding his interests, about which he was still too young to know anything at all. For Consul Teenapple, an uncle of Hans's deceased mother, was administrator of the Castorb estate. He put up the property for sale, took in hand the business of liquidating the firm of Castorp and Son, importers and exporters, and realised from the whole nearly 400,000 marks, the inheritance of young hands. This sum Consul Teenapple invested in trust funds and took unto himself 2% of the interest every quarter without impairment of his kinsmanly feeling. The Teenapple house lay at the foot of a garden in Harvest Hundstrasse, the windows looked out on a plot of lawn in which not the tiniest weed was suffered to flourish, then upon public rose borders and then upon the river. The consul went on foot every morning to his business in the old town, although he possessed more than one fine equipage, in order to get a little exercise, for he sometimes suffered from cerebral congestion. He returned in the same way at five in the afternoon, at which time the teen apples dined with due and fitting ceremony. He was a weighty man whose suits were always of the best English cloths. His eyes were watery blue and prominent behind his gold-rimmed glasses. His nose was ruddy and his square-cut beard was grey. He wore a flashing brilliant on the stubbing little finger of his left hand. His wife was long since dead. He had two sons, Peter and James, of whom one was in the navy and seldom at home, the other occupied in the paternal wine trade and destined heir to the business. The housekeeping for many years had been the care of an Altona goldsmith's daughter named Shaline, who wore starched white ruffles at her plump round wrists. Hers it was to see to it that the table, morning and evening, was richly laden with cold meats, with crabs and salmon, eel and smoked breast of goose, with tomato ketchup for the roast beef. She kept a watchful eye on the hired waiters when Consul Teenapple gave a gentleman's dinner, and she it was who, so far as in her lay, took the place of her mother to little Hans Castorp. So he grew up in wretched weather, in the teeth of wind and mist, grew up, so to say, in a yellow Macintosh, and generally speaking, he throve. A little anemic he had always been, so Dr. Hiddekin said, and had him take a good glass of porter after third breakfast every day when he came home from school. This, as everyone knows, is a hearty drink, Dr. Hedekin considered it a blood-maker, and certainly Hans Castle found it most soothing to his spirits and encouraging to a propensity of his, which his uncle Teenapple called dozing. Namely, sitting, staring into space, with his jaw dropped and his thoughts fixed on just nothing at all. But on the whole he was sound and fit, an adequate tennis player and rower, though actually handling the oars was less to his taste than sitting of a summer evening on the terrace of the Uhlenhorst Ferry House, with a good drink before him and the sound of music in his ears while he watched the lighted boats and the swans mirrored in the bright water. Hear him talk, sedate and sensible, in a rather low, monotonous voice, just tinged with dialect. Observe him in his blonde correctness with his well-shaped head, which had about it some stamp of the classic and his self-possessed, indolent bearing the fruit of innate, inherited, perfectly unconscious self-esteem. You would swear that this young Hans Castorp was a legitimate and genuine product of the soil in which he flourished, and strikingly at home in his environment. Nor would he, had he ever put such a question to himself, have been for a single second doubtful of the answer. Yes, he was thoroughly in his element in the atmosphere of this great seaboard city, this reeking air, compact of good living and a retail trade, that embraced the four corners of the earth. It had been the breath of his father's nostrils, and the sun drew it in with profound acquiescence and a sense of well-being. The exhalations from water, coals and tar, the sharp tang in the nostrils from heaped-up stacks of colonial produce, the huge steam cranes at the dockside imitating the quiet, the intelligence and the giant strength of elephants at work,
as they hoisted tons of sacks, bales, chests, vats and carboys out of the bowels of seagoing ships and conveyed them into waiting trains and scales. The businessmen in yellow rubber coats like his own streaming to the bourse at midday where, as he knew, there were often times pretty sharp work and a man might have to strengthen his credit at short notice by giving out invitations to a big dinner. All this he felt, saw, heard, knew. Besides it all, there was the field in which later was to lie his own particular interest, the confusion of the yards, the mammoth bodies of great ships, Asiatic and African liars. Besides it all, there was the field in which later was to lie his own particular interest, the confusion of the yards, the mammoth bodies of great ships, Asiatic and African liners, lying in dry dock, keel and propeller bare, supported by props as thick as tree trunks, lying there in monstrous helplessness, swarmed over by troops of men like dwarfs, scouring, whitewashing, hammering. There were the roofed-over ways, wrapped in wreaths of smoke like mist, holding the towering frames of rising ships, among which moved the engineers, blueprint and loading scale in hand, directing the work people. All these were familiar sights to Hans Castorp from his youth upwards, awaking in him only the agreeable, homely sensations of belonging, which were the prerogative of his years. Such sensations would reach their height when he sat of a Sunday forenoon with James Teenapple or his cousin Zemson, Joachim Zemson, in the pavilion at Ulster, breakfasting on hot cuts and smoked meat with a glass of old port, or when, having eaten, he would lean back in his chair and give himself up to his cigar. For therein especially was he true to type, that he liked good living, and notwithstanding his thin-bloodedness and look of over-refinement, clung to the grosser pleasures of life as a greedy suckling to its mother's breast. Comfortably, not without dignity, he carried the weight of culture with which the governing upper class of the commercial city endowed its children. He was as clean as a well-cared-for baby, and dressed by the tailor in whom the young men of his social sphere felt most confidence. Shally took beautiful care of his small stock of carefully marked linen, which was bestowed in a dressing chest on the English plan. When he studied away from home, he regularly sent back his laundry to be washed and mended, for it was a saying of his that outside Hamburg nobody in the kingdom knew how to iron. A rough spot on the cuff of his dainty coloured shirts filled him with acute discomfort. His hands, though not particularly aristocratic in shape, were well tended and fresh skinned, and he wore a platinum chain ring as well as the seal ring inherited from his grandfather. His teeth were rather soft and defective, and he had a number of gold fillings. Standing and walking, he rather stuck out his abdomen, which hardly made an athletic impression, but his bearing at table was beyond cavil. Sitting very erect, he would turn the whole upper part of his body to speak to his neighbour, with self-possession, of course, and a little plat, and he kept his elbows well in as he dismembered his piece of fowl, or deftly, with the appointed tool, drew the rosy flesh from a lobster's shell. His first requirement after a meal was the finger bowl of perfumed water, his second the Russian cigarette, which paid no duty, as he had a convenient way of getting them smuggled in. After the cigarette, the cigar, he favoured a Bremen brand called Maria Mancini, of which we shall hear more hereafter. The fragrant narcotic blended so smoothingly with the coffee. Hans Castorp protected his supply of tobacco from the injurious effects of steam heating by keeping it in the cellar, whither he would betake himself every morning to load his case with his stock for the day. It went against his grain to eat butter served in the piece instead of in little fluted balls. It will be seen that we mean to say everything that may be said in Hans Castorp's favour, yet without fulsomeness, not making him out as better or worse than he was. He was neither genius nor dunderhead, and if in our description of him we have avoided the use of the word mediocre, it has been for reasons quite unconnected with his intelligence, hardly even with any bearing upon his whole simple personality, but rather out of regard for his lot in life, to which we incline to ascribe a certain importance above and beyond personal considerations. His headpiece sustained without undue strain the demands made upon it by the course of the real gymnasium. Strain, indeed, was something to which he was quite definitely disinclined, whatever the circumstances or the object of his effort, less out of fear of hurting himself than because he positively saw no reason 
or more precisely, saw no positive reason for exertion. This, then, perhaps, is why we may not call him mediocre, that, somehow or other, he was aware of the lack of such a reason. A man lives not only his personal life as an individual, but also, consciously or unconsciously, the life of his epoch and his contemporaries. We may regard the general and personal foundations of his existence as definitely settled and taken for granted, and be as far from assuming a critical attitude towards them as our good Hans Castorp really was. Yet it is quite conceivable that he may nonetheless be vaguely conscious of the deficiencies of his epoch and find them prejudicial to his own moral well-being. All sorts of personal aims, ends, hopes, prospects hover before the eyes of the individual, and out of these he derives the impulse to ambition and achievement. Now, if the life about him, if his own time seem, however outwardly stimulating, to be at bottom empty of such food for his aspirations, if he privately recognise it to be hopeless, viewless, helpless, opposing only a hollow silence to all the questions man puts, consciously, unconsciously, yet somehow puts as to the final absolute and abstract meaning in all his efforts and activities, then in such a case a certain laming of the personality is bound to occur, the more inevitably, the more upright the character in question, a sort of palsy, as it were, which may even extend from his spiritual and moral over into his physical and organic part, in an age that affords no satisfying answer to the eternal question of why, to what end, a man who is capable of achievement over and above the average and expected modicum must be equipped either with a moral remoteness and single-mindedness which is rare indeed, and of heroic mould, or else with an exceptionally robust vitality. Hans Castor had neither the one nor the other of this, and thus he must be considered mediocre, though in an entirely honourable sense. All this that we have said has reference to the inward state of the young man, not only during his school years, but also in those that followed, after he had made choice of his civil profession. On his way through his forms at school, he had now and again to take one for the second time. But in the main, his origin, his good breeding, and also a pretty, if unimpassioned, gift for mathematics got him forward. And when he received his one-year service certificate, he made up his mind to continue at school, principally, it must be said, because he thus prolonged the situation he was used to, in which no definite decisions had to be taken, and which he had further time to think matters over and decide what he really wanted to do, which he was far from knowing after he had arrived at the top form. Even when it was finally decided, to say when Hans Castor finally decided it would be saying too much, he had the feeling that it might quite as well have been decided some other way. So much, however, was true, that he had always liked ships. As a small boy, he had filled the pages of his notebooks with drawings of fishing barks, five masters and vegetable barges, when he was fifteen, he had had a front seat at the christening ceremony of the new double-screw steamer, Hansa. He had watched her leave the ways at Blom and Vosses, and afterwards made quite a happy watercolour of the graceful ship, done with a good deal of attention to detail, and a loving and not unskilful treatment of the glassy green rolling waves. Constable of Teenapple hung it in his private office, and somebody told him that it showed talent that the artist might develop into a good marine painter, a remark which the consul could safely repeat to his ward, for Hans Castor only laughed good-humouredly, and not for a moment considered letting himself in for a career of being eccentric and not getting enough to eat. "'You haven't so much, you know,' his uncle Teenapple would say to him. "'James and Peter will get most of what I have. That is to say, it stops in the business, and Peter will draw his interest.' What belongs to you is well invested and brings you in something safe, but it's no joke living on your interest today unless one is at least five times what you have, and if you want to be somebody here in this town and live as you have been brought up to, you'll have to earn a good bit more to put up with it. You mark my words, my son. Hans Castorp marked them. He looked about for a profession suitable in his own eyes and those of his fellow citizens. And when he had once chosen, it came about at the instance of old Wilms of the firm of Tunder and Wilms, who said to Consul Teenapple at the Saturday whist table that young Castor ought to study shipbuilding. It would be a good idea he could come into his office and he would keep an eye on him. When he had once chosen, 
he thought very highly of his calling. It was, to be sure, confoundedly complicated and fatiguing, but all the same it was very first-rate, very solid, very important. And certainly, being peaceful in his tastes, he preferred it to that of his cousin Zemson, the son of his mother's half-sister, who was bent on being an officer. But Joachim Zemson was rather weak in the chest, and for that reason a calling which would keep him in the open, in which there was no mental strain or fatigue to speak of, might be quite the right thing for him. Hans Castorp thought with easy condescension. He had the greatest respect for work, though personally he found that he tired easily. And here we revert to our suggestion of a few pages back. The idea that an unfavourable influence exerted by a man's personal life by the times in which he lives may even extend to his physical organism. Hans Castorp respected work, as how should he not have? It would have been unnatural. Work was for him, in the nature of things, the most estimable attribute of life. When you came down to it, there was nothing else that was estimable. It was the principle by which one stood or fell, the absolute of the time. It was, so to speak, its own justification. His regard for it was as religious in its character, and so far as he knew, unquestioning. But it was another matter whether he loved it, and that he could not do, however great his regard, the simple reason being that he did not agree with him. Exacting occupation dragged at his nerves. It wore him out. Quite openly he confessed that he liked better to have his time free, not weighted with the leaden load of effort, lying spacious before him, not divided up by obstacles one had to grit one's teeth and conquer one after the other. These conflicting sentiments in the subject word had, strictly speaking, to be reconciled. Is it perhaps possible, if he had been able to believe in work as a positive value, a self-justifying principle, believe in it in the very depth of his soul, even without being himself conscious of doing so, that his body as well as his spirit, first the spirit and through it the body as well, would have been able to devote itself to his task with more of joy and constancy, would have been able to find peace therein. Here again is posed the question of Hans Castorp's mediocrity, or more than mediocrity, to which we would give no hard and fast answer. For we do not set up as the young man's encomiast, and prefer to leave room for the other view, namely that his work stood somewhat in the way of his unclouded enjoyment of his Maria Mancini. To military service he was not inclined, his being revolted against it, and found ways of making difficulties. It may be, too, that staff medical officer Dr. Eberding, who visited at Harvard Studerstrasse, heard from Consul Tienapel, in the course of conversation, that young Castorp was leaving home to begin his technical studies, and would find a call to the colours a very sensible interruption to his labours. Working slowly and deliberately, he kept up his soothing habit of porter breakfasts while he was away. He filled his brain with analytic and descriptive geometry, differential calculus, mechanics, projection, hydrostatic, reckoned full and empty displacement, stability, trim moment and metacenter, and sometimes he got very sick of it. His technical drawings, the drafts and designs of frames, water lines and longitudinal projections, were not quite so good as the picturesque representation of the Hansa on the high seas. But wherever it was in place to call in the sense perceptions to help out the intellectual, wherever he could wash in the shadows and lay on the cross-sections in the conventional colours, there Hans Castor showed more dexterity than most. When he came home for the holidays, very clean, very well dressed, with a little red blonde moustache that became his sleepy young patrician face, obviously en route to a considerable position in life, people looked at him, the people who concerned themselves with the affairs in the community, and made it their business to know all about family and social relations, and that, in a self-governing city-state, meant most of the population. They looked him well over, his fellow citizens, and asked themselves what public role young Castorp was destined to fill. He had traditions, his name was old and good. They would certainly have to reckon with him one day as a political factor. Some day he would sit in the assembly or on the board of directors. He would help make the laws. He would occupy some honourable office and share the burdens of sovereignty. He would belong to the executive branch, perhaps, or the finance or building commission. His voice would be listened to, his vote would count. It would be interesting to see what party he would choose. Appearances were deceiving, but he did not look as a man does whom the Democrats can count on. 
and his likeness to his grandfather was unmistakable. Would he take after him and be a drag, a conserved element? It was quite possible, but so was the opposite. He was an engineer, studying shipbuilding on the technical side, in touch with world commerce. He might turn out to be a radical, a reckless spender, a profane destroyer of old buildings and landscape beauties. He might be as unfettered as a Jew, as irreverent as an American. He might prefer a ruthless break with tradition to a considered development of natural resources. He might incline to plunge the state into foolhardy experimentation. All that was conceivable. Was it in his blood to feel that their worships in the Senate, before whom the double century of the Rat House presented arms, were likely to know best in all contingencies? Or would he side with the opposition in the Assembly? In his blue eyes, under their reddish-brown brows, his fellow citizens read no answer to their curious questioning. And he probably knew none himself, Hans cast off this still unwritten page. When he took the journey upon which we have encountered him, he was in his twenty-third year. He had spent four semesters at the Danzig Polytechnic, four more at the technical schools of Braunschweig and Karlsruhe, and had just previously passed his first final, quite respectably, if without any fanfare of trumpets. And now he was preparing to enter the firm of Tunder and Wilms as volunteer apprentice in order to get his practical training in the shipyards. But at this point his life took the following turn. He had had to work hard and steadily for his examination, and came home looking rather paler than a man of his blonde rosy type should do. Dr. Hiddekin scolded and insisted on a change of air, a complete change, not a stay at Norderney or Wick on Four. That would not mend matters this time, he said. If they wanted his advice, it was that Hans Castor should go for a few weeks to the high mountains before he took up his work in the yards. Consul Tinapol told his nephew and foster son he approved of the plan, only that in that case they would part company for the summer, for wild horses couldn't drag him into the high mountains. They were not for him. He required a reasonable atmospheric pressure, else he might get an attack. Hans Castor would be good enough to go by himself, let him pay his cousin Zimson a visit. It was an obvious suggestion. Joachim Zimson was ill, not ill like Hans Castor, but in all seriousness, critically. There had been a great scare, in fact. He had always been subject to feverish catarrh, and one day he actually spat blood. Whereupon he had been rushed off to Davos, heels overhead, to his great distress and affliction, for he had just then arrived within sight of the goal of all his hopes. Some semesters long he had complied with the wish of his family and studied law. Then, yielding to irresistible inward urging, he had changed over, presented himself as ensign, and been accepted. And now for the past five months he had been stuck in the International Sanatorium Berghof, directing physician Hofrad Behrens, and was bored half-sick as he wrote home on postcards. If Hans Castor wanted to do himself a good turn before he entered his post at Tunger and Wilms, what more natural than that he should go up to Davos and keep his poor cousin company for a while? It would be agreeable on both sides. It was midsummer before he made up his mind to go, Already the last week in July, he left for a stay of three weeks.